Representative Kilmer, thank you so much for joining us. You bet. Good to be with you. Why don't we start with your background? You know, what was sort of, uh, where'd you come from and what did you do before uh, politics and how'd you get into it and what are you doing now? It's probably the most common question I get is, dear God, how did you end up in Congress? Uh, so I actually grew up in my district. I grew up in a little logging town on the coast of Washington state. And I was in high school right around the time the timber industry took it on the chin. And I saw a lot of my friends' parents lose their jobs. Um, a good chunk of my neighbors lose their jobs. And it had a big impact on my life trajectory. I went off to college uh, at Princeton. I studied public policy with a focus on economic development. I looked at challenges facing timber towns in the Pacific Northwest and then did the same thing in graduate school. Uh, I did a doctorate in social policy at Oxford and I looked at mining towns in the UK and, log and timber towns in Washington, really trying to get my head around the question of, you know, how do we foster more sustainable communities? Um, and uh, I never thought I'd run for office. I um, uh, came back home. I worked uh, as a management co consultant for a few years, um, trying to get out of student debt and uh, get a little bit of private sector experience. And then I went and worked for a nonprofit focused on economic development in our region, trying to bring more jobs to our area and trying to keep the jobs of the employers that we had. And I kept finding myself saying, gosh, you know what government does and doesn't do sure impacts our ability to grow jobs uh, for good and for bad. And um, uh, finally, some of my friends said, you know, you seem to have a lot of good ideas and you sure as hell complain a lot. Why don't you go do something about it, pal? And the next thing I knew, I was uh, running for the Washington State House and served a couple years in the State House and then um, six years in the State Senate. And then uh, in 2012, uh, ran successfully for Congress. And that's how I ended up here. And in Congress, can you just briefly talk about which, uh, what has your focus been and you know what, what uh, committees have you served on, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, perhaps not surprising based on my background, um, you know, my, uh, w w when I got into this job, we wrote out a strategic plan for what we wanted to get done for our district. And there's two really main areas of our strategic plan. One is just trying to create more economic opportunity for more people in more places. Uh, uh, and two is um, trying to make government work better, period. And uh, so my work here really falls into those uh, two categories. I serve on the Appropriations Committee. A lot of what I work on on that committee is geared towards uh, economic opportunity. I'm on uh, the Defense Subcommittee. Uh, the district I represent, the largest employer, is the federal government and is the Defense Department. Um, I'm on the Interior and Environment Subcommittee, which deals with uh, Puget Sound, which is vitally important both from an environmental standpoint and an economic standpoint to our region. Uh, it, that subcommittee also deals with the national parks and national forests, which my district has, uh, and again, big economic drivers in our region. There's 11 Native American tribes in the district I represent, and the Interior and Environment Subcommittee uh, has jurisdiction over uh, things like the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So that's the other, that's another subcommittee on which I serve. And then the third subcommittee is the Energy and Water Subcommittee, and that has uh, uh, purview over things like addressing the climate crisis and uh, our national research, our Department of Energy research labs. And there is one in my district. In fact, it's the only marine lab in the uh, Department of Energy's national lab system. And so it's a great committee for me um, and for my constituents to have me serving on uh, because it enables us to pursue um, priorities that help us create more economic opportunity. Um, and then for the last uh, two and a half years, I've served as the chair of a new committee in Congress, a, se a select committee. Every 20 or 30 years or so, Congress realizes things aren't working the way they ought to, and they create a committee to do something about it. This year's iteration of that is called the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, which makes me sound like the chair of the IT help desk, but really it's, it's been nicknamed the Fixed Congress Committee. It's been tasked with trying to make Congress work better for the American people. And that's a big part of what I work on too. You know, certainly with this committee, um, looking at kind of what's working and what's not working in Congress, 
I also work on a, a lot on issues related to campaign finance reform. I think there's too much money in our political system. And so that's a big priority uh, for me as well. Um, and I've worked on a number of bills uh, uh, focused on addressing uh, that. Excellent. We're all big fans of what you've done on the uh, on the modernization committee, and it's been really inspirational to so many people. So thank you for that that work. Uh, and you. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of guests on the program who have testified before the committee and uh, gotten to get deeper into some of their thoughts that they shared with you. So maybe the next question I can focus on is, um, you know, your district itself. You've already brought it up a few times, but you know, it's always interesting to hear about uh, a member's perspective on their own district. You know, uh, you know, what's unique about it and where did, do you see it evolving in terms of the future since you have to think about that as it, as it goes forward? I have a really diverse district. I so Washington six district is the furthest Northwest uh, in the continental United States. Um, I represent basically from Tacoma West uh, to the Pacific Ocean. And um, I say it's diverse for a number of reasons. You know, we have a, a city, Tacoma. I represent about 70% of the population of Tacoma, which has all of the opportunities and challenges that cities have uh, right now, uh, challenges with regard to housing affordability and homelessness, challenges with regard to traffic congestion and those sorts of things, like a lot of other cities. Um, Kitsap County is in my district. That is a Navy County. Um, uh, it, it, the primary employer is the uh, is Naval Base Kitsap and the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. And um, there are unique challenges in an uh, area where the federal government is the main employer. You know, certainly when you see some of the uh, budget dysfunction that you've seen out of our nation's capital, that is a strain in a district like mine. And then a third of my district is, is very rural. It's the Olympic Peninsula, um, Clallam County, where I grew up. I grew up in a town called Port Angeles. Um, and then down the coast, uh, Jefferson County, Grace Harbor County, and Mason County are more rural counties. And so, and, and those counties have a lot of the challenges that a lot of rural areas have in terms of trying to ensure adequate economic opportunity. There are communities that I represent that care very deeply about ensuring that their main export won't be young people. They want to make sure that there are uh, industries that exist to create economic opportunity there. Um, and that's, that's really driven a lot of my work. I don't want it, I, you know, I think no matter what zip code you live in, you should have you should have a shot. You should have economic opportunity. So that drives a lot of what I work on. Great. Well, let's move on to the question next about um, your time in Congress and sure. the mechanics of bill creation. Obviously, everything starts with bills in Congress somehow. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, what bills do you side to sponsor and why? Does it come from your district? Is it personal? Is it is it national in orientation? You know, what's the driving force behind each of the Congresses you've been in, what bills you've decided to submit, and then also which ones you decide to co-sponsor? Yeah, great questions. And usually, so uh, both in terms of what I sponsor and, and what I co-sponsor, um, you know, there's always that threshold question of, so what's the problem that we're trying to solve uh, and why is it a legitimate problem? Or what's the opportunity that we're trying to embrace? And why is that a legitimate opportunity? And then looking at potential ways to solve for that uh, and hopefully have a legitimate solution too. And that can come from different things. And frankly, it doesn't always come in the form of a standalone bill. It can also, you know, I serve on the Appropriations Committee. A lot of what we work on um, is trying to drive resources to things that also solve problems uh, for our area. So for example, you know, I mentioned uh, Puget Sound is just vitally, vitally important to our area and is unfortunately a very sick body of water. And that is a concern for our economy. It's a concern in terms of our environmental ethic. It's a concern for the Native American tribes that have treaty protected rights. And you know, so some of what we work on, in fact, the uh, House uh, Appropriations Interior Subcommittee just passed uh, out of committee the interior bill, um, which provides a record amount of funding for Puget Sound recovery. Now, interestingly enough, we also just passed out of the House uh, a couple of weeks back a bill called the Puget SOS Act to have the federal government step up uh, and serve as a better uh, more collaborative partner to the communities on the ground uh, on in the Puget Sound region to support the work of the tribes uh, 
of the state of the local governments. Um, you know, so in that instance, we were trying to we're trying to solve for let's recover Puget Sound and all of the species that depend upon it being healthy. And in some instances, that standalone legislation like the Puget SOS Act, in some instances, it's trying to get funding through um, uh, through the Appropriations Committee. We're about to introduce a bill called the Recompete Act, and that came from identifying a problem statement and then working with uh, actually some economists uh, some from some of the think tanks here in Washington, D.C. The problem statement that we identified was that there are communities that have faced persistent distress, and I represent a whole bunch of them. And when you break down some of the challenges that they faced, there were sort of three themes that came out of it. One, by and large, those communities, uh, you know, had struggled to navigate the complex system of federal grants and loans. Most of them don't have grant writers on staff. Two, while a one-off grant is helpful, most of these communities didn't fall into their struggles in one year, and they're probably not going to get out of their struggles in one year. So having a prolonged commitment to their economic recovery is really important. And third, there was a recognition that different communities have different needs. You know, if you look at some parts of my district, uh, you know, they don't have broadband access. So if they had some help, that's what they would spend it on. Some communities need help with workforce development. You know, if you're in Aberdeen and Hoquiam, the biggest challenge is that 90% of the land mass is in the floodplain. So they've really struggled to secure um, uh, housing development and economic development in the absence of addressing that flooding issue. So what we've proposed and what we will soon introduce is a bill that would provide some flexible long-term grants to persistently distressed communities. And in that instance, we worked with Brookings and uh, an economist who's, a, who's kind of co-located at Brookings and Upjohn um, uh, with EIG and others trying to ensure that we had something that I think could really be a difference maker for those communities. Because when I hear President Biden talk about building back better, what I think I hear him saying is a recognition that there were communities that were hurting before any of us had heard of COVID-19. You know, sometimes it's a more parochial issue. I represent um, uh, Olympic National Park, which everyone who's watching this should come and visit because it's glorious. Um, and please spend lots of money while you're in town. Uh, but we have a maintenance backlog within our national park system. So I worked on legislation um, to address the maintenance backlog in our national parks. That ended up becoming part of a broader effort that I ended up co-sponsoring, but I had led standalone legislation. And then we co-sponsored other legislation to, uh, to get that uh, priority across the finish line. Sometimes, so, sometimes, so it sounds like, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I know I'm, I'm, I'm rambling on, but uh, I can give you two more quick examples. You know, sometimes it comes from a constituent. We got outreach from uh, workers at the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard who said, hey, you know, I work, I started my work at the same time as this colleague of mine, but they're able to retire now and I'm not because I started uh, as a provisional employee or as a, uh, like, as not a permanent worker. I started on contract or something like that. And I can't even buy back the time and retire along with the people who've been working just as long as I have. So we introduced a, a bill called the Federal Retirement Fairness Act. And that literally came from constituents saying, hey, I got a problem. And then sometimes there's just a cool idea. Um, you know, I had a, a, a friend of mine from college uh, who um, had worked for a nonprofit focused on helping um, uh, asset poor people um, try to save money. And it was kind of an interesting research that they did with an economist. And, and what they found was asset poor people, unfortunately, the data suggested disproportionately didn't have any savings. Um, and also the um, findings were that they disproportionately gamble or play the lottery. And so they said, what if we could um, uh, embrace the excitement of gambling and playing the lottery, but have it apply to saving money? So they came up with this concept called prize linked savings, in which if you deposited money into an account, you would earn a chance. Uh, and the chance was for cash prizes that would go into your account and your money was never at risk, but a financial institution could use it to, um, uh, use their marketing budget to provide prizes. What they found was it dramatically impacted savings behavior and helped asset poor people build assets. The other thing they found was that it was illegal. Um, 
And when I heard about this, I was like, well, that's something we could work on. And so I led the bill in the House and Elizabeth Warren led it in the Senate. And it was bipartisan in both the House and the Senate and was um, signed into law. And now we have uh, community lenders in our district that are offering these prize link savings accounts and helping people um, build some assets and get out of poverty. That sounds like straight out of behavioral economics. Uh... Uh, so uh, it sounds like some of the some of these ideas are coming from the district in terms of individuals. Some of them are more theoretical. Uh, some of them are your personal experience, and they work their way into bills that you sponsor or co-sponsor. But also, you also see the committees as a way to achieve some of the same objectives, particularly appropriations. Is that is that right? Well, absolutely. You know, I, I love serving on the appropriations committee. Uh, in part because I think, you know, when you look at how a government spends its money, it's really an articulation of its values. And so, you know, as we look at some of these priorities related to affordable housing, as we look at priorities related to economic development or educational opportunity or combating the climate crisis, the Appropriations Committee really lends itself to advancing those priorities in a really positive way. Great. Well, why don't we move on to um, something about your time? You know, we, time is, a, is something I've asked a lot of our guests and how members spend their time. Um, and the demands on that time is, of course, extreme. Uh, so how do you spend, what's your personal time breakdown uh, with, you know, legislative work versus oversight versus campaign types of work? How, how do you see your own time and where do you wish it was? I spent a lot of time meeting with constituents. Um, if you looked at my calendar, and that's both in DC, um, often virtually during the pandemic and hopefully back to in-person. And then when I'm in the district, um, you know, I'm not sitting in an office, I'm mostly running around the district, listening to my constituents, hearing what their concerns are, being available and accessible and accountable to them, uh, which I think is how it ought to be. I do think the balance of how, uh, how much of the time Congresses in DC versus back home in their district is a bit out of whack. You know, if you go back pre pandemic, I think the number was Congress was in Washington DC for 65 full days and 66 travel days. That's probably not like that's not the right ratio, um, in part because uh, what that means, and this gets at your question around committees, and, and I know one of the questions you want to ask about is, you know, kind of how would you change how committees function? Part of our challenge right now, I think, is the congressional calendar, where the average member of Congress is on 5.4 committees and subcommittees. If you look at that calendar with 65 full days and 66 um, travel days, by and large, those committees aren't meeting on travel days. So you're trying to pack all of the function of congressional committees into about 65 days, that's insufficient. And so one of the things that the Select Committee on Modernization is looking at is, you know, could, could you change that up, right? Could you at least have more full days than you've got travel days? Um, you know, and to the credit of House leadership, they've changed up the calendar somewhat since we've come out with some of these recommendations, including having, as they have this week, a committee only week where rather than committees competing with floor activity, there's dedicated time for committees to be meeting. Um, and so appropriations is meeting for full days, four out of the five days uh, this week. And I think that's, I think that's a positive uh, step. You know, in terms of what that means into, in, in terms of the aggregate, the, the pie chart of my time, you know, when I'm in district, it's predominantly uh, outreach to my constituents. Um, uh, and then when I'm in DC, it's a combination of meeting with constituents, either virtually or when they're back here. I'm in legislating, going into, uh, going into um, committee and, and, and doing the work of, of, uh, of, uh, of those committees. Um, I will say also, and it's one of the things that the select committee is going to look at, I think probably committees could spend more time on oversight. Uh, uh, you know, the Appropriations Committee does some of that. I know other committees are required by House rules to have an oversight plan, but my sense is um, there could be a bit more focus on, on, on oversight. So as I think about what changes I would make, you know, having a, um, a bit more time carved out for that, I think would be important. 
not in the not in the way you've often seen it in Congress, which is you know kind of playing a gotcha game with the administration or something like that. But you know, really constructively looking at okay, well, we funded this program or we authorized this program. How's it working? And you know, what's what's working? What's not working? If we're going to reauthorize that, how should we be thinking about it? You know, and really developing some knowledge as a committee. I think that's how I would envision. Um, committees working more ideally is to develop that kind of knowledge um, and having the time to do that. Yeah, I think that's a, a very good point and something that we've discussed internally as well. What would be the, the ideal kind of oversight mechanism that Congress could implement, right? That wouldn't be uh, judge and jury. It would be instead something systematic and ongoing, you know, almost like a you know, the way I think of it as a board of directors, how can you meet on a regular basis to review performance uh, of, of the, of the uh, executive branch and in a particular area where you've appropriated money? I think that makes sense. A lot of work to do there. We talked with the Partnership for Public Service about that. I think they've also been engaged in a little bit of that kind of brainstorming. Yeah. Um, but if we go back, you know, obviously you've thought about these things probably more than any other member of Congress by this stage, you know, running the Modernization Committee, so many witnesses, a lot of thoughtful testimony. Um, you know, obviously you've done a great job running this committee and that you've, you know, made all these recommendations on a unanimous basis or at least a huge, uh, uh, you know, a big, uh, a lot of support for the, the, about the recommendations that have come through. But what about personally? If I had to ask you personally, you know, break down Congress's time in your ideal world, what would it be? I think Congress would be in DC a bit more. Um, we should have more full working days in DC. Um, you know, one of the things that's been discussed is could you just have Congress in DC for two weeks straight and work kind of Monday 9 a.m. to Friday 5 p.m. and then start the next Monday 9 a.m.? That would mean for a West Coast member like me, I would stay here for the weekend, which is not ideal, but. Um, you know, right now I'm spending far more time with the fine people of Alaska Airlines, um, not which is not to diss them, they're delightful. However, that is not probably the highest and best use of, of, of time. Um, if you did something along the lines of, you know, two straight weeks in DC, um, you know, and then something like two weeks in the district, you actually have more time for legislating, more time for committees meeting, and more time in the district. What you lose out on is travel time. Um, that may be, if you just match that up against the current calendar, all you lose is travel time if you did something like that. That doesn't seem crazy to me. Um, I would, uh, I, I also think that more work needs to be done, and it's something that our committee is looking at, at deconflicting committee meetings. Again, bearing in mind that the average member serves on 5.4 committees and subcommittees. So oftentimes, if you're watching C-SPAN, um, one, it means you um, have a lot of time on your hands. But two, if you're watching C-SPAN, you've likely seen that committees may have maybe have more empty chairs than full chairs. That is not necessarily a suggestion that your member of Congress is not doing their job. It's that they have three jobs that they've been assigned at the same time, that they've been expected to be in three committees at the same time. And it is very difficult for members to develop the sort of knowledge base that you want them to have when they have to be in three committees at the same time. And so the consequence of those conflicts is that too often a member will spend um, you know, the minimum amount of time in their committee, they'll use their five minutes allotted to try to make a speech that they can put on social media, not actually to develop the knowledge that the American people need them to develop. And then they'll jump to their next committee and repeat. Um, and I don't think that's ideal. Uh, so uh, I really think, so. one, if you had more days in DC, it might likely means you could further deconflict uh, committee meetings. And two, one of the things we recommended is there should be sort of a committee scheduling mothership in which as a committee contemplates scheduling something, they could populate a calendar. So at the very least, they would see, okay, this is how many of my committee members are going to have a conflict if I schedule the meeting at this time. 
Yeah, that's pretty much a no brainer is to have some kind of smart scheduling system for committee meetings that would minimize conflict conflicts and uh, maximize member time. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, we I had one of my colleagues, we, we just had two terrific hearings um, looking at culture in Congress, which you may want to talk about, too. But, um, you know, and we really tried to avoid conflicts. And yet several of our committee members ended up with conflicts. And one of the members of the select committee texted me and said, high schools have figured out how to do this better. And there's something to that. I, I really think there's an opportunity for Congress to raise its game on that front. Yeah. And, and it seems like that would have to be driven part by leadership, right? To Because they can control the schedule. So it has to come from there. And to their credit, they have made some efforts, including, as I mentioned, the, the committee only weeks. That helps with the deconfliction. That is, that's a positive step forward. Um, I think there are other steps we can take. Right, well, let's move on to the, the, the notion of rules. Um, rules is a obviously a very contentious question because it, it can lead to you know, power change for the majority of the minority, what have you. Um, but you've been thinking about rules, I'm sure, for a long time. You've run committees, you've been on committees, and you've been on the floor. Where do you think rules, let's start with committees, right? Um, your committee is noted for uh, working well. Now, you have a very unique committee, on the other hand, Right. So what rules do you think there should be in committees to maximize committee performance? Yeah. So one of the things that we as a committee proposed was providing more flexibility committees to experiment with format. I'll give you a quick example. So we did this and we actually passed it as part of our committee's rules was to enable our committee to um, do things like we did in the last hearing we had. So let me give an example. We did not, as an example, um, sit on a dais with one party on one side of the dais and the other party on the other side of the dais. We had Democrats sitting next to Republicans in a circle and we had our witnesses at eye level with us and we had a conversation. Um, you know, I've never found it particularly effective um, to speak to the back of someone's head. And yet, if you look at many committees in Congress, that's that's how discussion takes place. Beyond that, um, I mentioned there's this sort of gravitation toward five minute speechifying, rather than really using the time in committee to, for knowledge development. And so in our committee, in these last two hearings, what we did was we said, what if instead of giving everybody five minutes, we just promise we're gonna be fair with the time and we'll keep track of the time. But if someone's pulling on a thread, and you think that's what I wanna ask about too, just kind of wave and we'll call on you and you can pull that thread too. And we can try to build on each other's knowledge and we'll make sure that Democrats and Republicans have about the same amount of time. Um, and I have to tell you, so that was an experiment and you know, and listen, there are experiments that can go horribly wrong. That was not one of them for our committee. The feedback I got from Democrats and Republicans was, wow, I really wish Congress would do that more often, at least in subcommittee, because that's a smaller number of people and that is a manageable type of discussion to do. And it really lent itself to, rather than the five minute clip that you can stick on social media, it was a discussion and people were listening to each other. People weren't reading speeches. They were saying like, that was really interesting what you just said, I wanna follow up on that. And that is really rare unfortunately in the Congress. Um, the other thing that I would say is, um, you know, some of what uh, uh, Congress has done, you know, did back in the 90s, did not help in terms of the uh, knowledge development within committees. Um, the budgets that committees were provided were, were slashed pretty substantially in the 90s. And even some of the support organizations, um, uh, you know, were either eliminated or cut. You know, the Office of Technology Assessment is a good example of that. You know, that was really intended to be what helped Congress understand technology issues. You know, and anytime I hear a constituent say, man, I watched the Facebook hearings, you know, and it doesn't seem like Congress knows, you know, really understands the subject that, 
you know, the reaction is, yeah, that we've, we've got some work to do there as an institution. And one of the things we can do to support that is to have entities like the Office of Technology Assessment that are driving the thinking within Congress and getting members of Congress up to speed. Um, so those are some things that come, in mind, come to mind in terms of uh, the work of, of committees. And what about, in, I mean, but in the case that you've noted in the modernization committee, I mean, the, the committee heads all have a kind of a, they all have control of the rules in the committee ultimately, right? They're, they, they do have a lot of uh, power to determine what the committee does. Uh, and, you know, if you have a benevolent chairman, uh, then uh, you're going to have maybe a more productive committee than others. In all of your experiences, are there rules that you think that could be, you know, spread among all the committees that would make it a more productive committee? I mean, it is um, literally the subject of our next hearing. So um, I may have a better answer for you after that than I have, uh, than I have right now. Um, but I think you get at an important point, which is some of the challenges that we face in Congress are not about rules, they're about norms, you know, they're about culture. I came out of, and this is less about committees and more about um, floor activity. I came out of a state legislative body where every bill was taken up under what's called an open rule, which meant if you had an amendment that it was at all germane to the subject matter of the legislation, or as they say in the Washington State Legislature, within the scope and object of the bill, you could offer an amendment, it would be debated, and it would be voted on. And I can count maybe, maybe five, maybe six times in eight years in the Washington State Legislature where I saw that abused, where someone played gotcha politics and said, I'm going to use this as a, you know, to bludgeon my political opposition. That's not a rules issue, right? That's a norms issue. The culture was don't be a jerk. And yet, is, as you look at some of the use of floor time and as, as you mentioned, you know, sometimes the dynamic in committee is not as constructive and so literally the last two hearings we had were, so how do you fix that? And it's tricky. I mean, it's a really challenging dynamic, um, particularly given, um, you know, I think the partisanship that you see in Congress is to some degree a reflection of the division that you see outside of Congress throughout the country. Yeah, unfortunately the norms are also rules, right? Uh, that are harder to change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can't you can't write a change to the norms and then have it implemented. Unfortunately, it, it's it, it's a really interesting subject. I mean, part of the reason we had this hearing where we heard from, you know, we heard from a woman who wrote a book called High Conflict, which is a terrific uh, terrific read. Um, uh, that that looked at you know sometimes you have the, the the founders did not presume that we would all sit in a room hold hands and sing kumbaya with each other or you know close our eyes and do trust falls into each other's arms they assumed there would be conflict and that's healthy that is presumed and yet um she distinguishes that from what she calls high conflict in her book where the conflict is in service of the conflict and that is too often uh, reflected in our current politics um, I think it's, you know, part of what we're looking at in this committee is how do you foster more collaboration, which is not to say that I, as a Democrat, am going to compromise my values or sell out my values, but we've got to figure out how to talk about tough issues and not have every interaction turn into the Jerry Springer show. And so that, that is really part of what we've been looking at. And that has driven some of the suggestions getting back to your original question around committees. So, you know, one of the things that we recommended was that committees should have um, bipartisan agenda setting retreats. We did that in our committee and we started with, you know, actually we started with the question, why did you come to Congress and how has it met or failed to meet your expectations? And as people talked it through that answer, you started kind of coming up with a list of stuff that this committee could work on because there were areas in which Congress was failing to meet expectations where you said like, well, that ought to be something you can fix. Um, you know, that kind of bipartisan conversation may be tough on some committees. It may be on near impossible on some committees, but even the most partisan committees have some things where Democrats and Republicans have figured out a way to work with each other. And so having that type of, I've listen, I've never been part of an organization uh, 
that at the beginning of a project didn't start out with, so what do we wanna get done? And that doesn't really happen, certainly not in a bipartisan way in Congress. And that's one of the things that our committee, um, as you pointed out with unanimous support, uh, recommended.